Right, cool. Welcome to our February uh, 2024 State TA Day webinar. Um, we have a pretty packed schedule today and lots of wonderful information to share with you. And um, so we're going to kick it off. Um, we have Ivan Rodriguez, our data manager from Clayton Early Learning to kick us off today. So welcome, Ivan. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. I know I've talked with several of you already about different things, but it's nice to see you all again. Um, just wanted to touch on a couple quick points that we've been discussing over here on the Colorado Shine side. Um, the first one is we just want to better help the data team score indicators and to help ensure that programs are receiving their proper credit um, for their documentation upload. We're, we're asking programs to make the effort to include their standalone policies in their policy manual and parent handbooks. So I know a lot of programs have been trying to submit standalone policies um, before trying to add the director signature and a date stamp on it. But we'd really like for these to come through as more um, inclusive in their actual policy manuals in their parent handbooks. Um, typically, these standalone policies were more widely used during the pandemic when programs needed to quickly uh, make some changes on the fly. But now that the pandemic is more or less over, um, we really like to have these as part of the program's overall policy. It kind of just helps ensure that quality is happening within the center and that parents have it all in one place. And same with staff. Um, and when scoring, many of these standalone policies are not being submitted properly. They're not having the signature or the date implementation. And so we really just want to make sure that the programs are receiving credit for all the quality work that they're doing. And in order to do that, we'd like them just to be in that policy manual so we can score it a little bit easier and ensure that they're getting the credit for those. Um, so if you guys can help us with that, we'd greatly appreciate it. The other item that we're going to talk about quickly is just when it comes to the ERS scoring, um, the scoring sheets. There has been some talk around sharing the assessor score sheets with coaches and programs. And um, we just wanted to let everybody out there know that we're currently, um, we're, Clayton and the state are currently reviewing that policy on sharing the score sheets. And we're working to see how we can better partner with the coaches and the programs, um, but we don't have an exact policy in place yet. Well, I guess an updated update to the policy. Right now, the current policy is um, basically saying that we're not sharing the score sheets, but we're trying to work on that to see how we can be more inclusive of all the programs and the coaches. And we will let you guys know of any updates um, to the current policy as soon as we have it. And it looked like there was a question about the evidence guide and if we're gonna update that. Um, so we are still trying to give credit for those standalone policies because we do understand that standalone policies do exist and that things do happen. And, and there are some centers where it, it takes a year sometimes to review. A, um, a, it has to be approved by the board or by a district. And so we know sometimes these policy manuals take a little bit longer to um, to change. And when you're getting ready for a rating, you might not be able to do that or within that rating um, year even. So we do still accept standalone policies. We would just like them to be less we'd like less than the policies to come through and just as much as the programs can include those in their policy handbooks because a lot of these standalone policies are already policies that should be in the handbook it's just that they were created um as once again those standalone policies so we will still accept them but we're just hoping to kind of accept them more far and few in between as opposed to having so many come in um again part of the reason why is because when centers are submitting them they're submitting them improperly and we're not able to score them and give them credit for those policies so the easiest way of doing that is to ensure that they're in those policy manuals did i answer that question um if there's no other questions for well, thanks ivan we'll work on some language uh just to get in alignment yes. with the you know it could even be we could even just say it's recommended that yeah. you submit yes. this way that sort of thing yeah and it's just more or less a best practice for the centers to have so that when when families are enrolling or they have new staff they're not having them in a, a, a manual and then eight other sheets to look at like it really should just be all in one and so it's just kind of a best practice as well 
Well, if there's no other questions, I appreciate the time. And um, if you don't have my email, it's on the agenda. Please feel free to always email me with any data indicator questions, any scheduling questions when it comes to that. Um, me and my team are here to help any way we can with all the coaches and the providers. So um, I know I said a lot, but we want to be as transparent with everything and be helpful with all of the programs that we um, serve and all of you coaches. So please email me with any questions that do come up or any assistance that you do need through the process. So thank you for the time. I appreciate it and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ivan. We really appreciate your work and yeah, we're super excited about the way uh, programs have been going and have been scheduled and um, I speak on behalf of everyone when I say uh, you're doing awesome in your role and we really appreciate that you're here. Thank you, appreciate that as well. Um, all right, Emily has a real quick e, e update for all of us. Hi, everyone. Great to see you all. And as uh, Charlie said, my e, e update's really quick. Uh, you can see we're at just below $2 million to award to e, e programs. Um, we have about 4.5 million um, in requests that are under review. And I feel like it's gonna go fast. Um, well, let me back up. We have a lot of programs that have applied that are in the process of and completing large construction or capital projects. And so I know it seems like we've sat at this holding pattern for a couple months now. And I think that as those projects begin to wrap up in the spring that we will be working through this last funds pretty you know pretty uh quickly so i'll of course keep you posted um as we continue on this journey and um we'll go you know i'll send you emails and the like so um and of course be here so if you have any questions don't hesitate to reach out to me um, or to come to office hours, it will be lovely to see you. Um, and the only other update I have is about your emerging and expanding contract. So these are being sent out. Um, so please watch your inbox. I know that there's been a couple contracts where we have to update or touch base with you all on them. So we're in the process of doing that as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight here is that we received notice this morning from our fiscal team that there's going to be an updated subrecipient monitoring and performance and assessment requirement within any new contracts. And so you'll see this requirement in the additional provisions section, and it's basically a Google form that you'll fill out within 30 days of contract execution. and it is very similar or possibly identical to the one that you filled out last year um, that Bonnie sent you. So I also imagine that this will be a similar requirement for um, the contracts with base funds, although I'm not totally sure. So just check that additional provisions section when you, whenever you get a contract, because that's where these kind of requirements will probably show up. Um, I went the wrong way, everyone. Okay, as you all know, I have office hours weekly, except not this Monday because I may have jury duty. So, say whatever, do whatever you do around whatever you think about jury duty because that might be me on Monday. Um, but normally it's Mondays from 1.30 to 2.30 and Wednesdays from 10 to 11. If you'd like to be added to this list, please let me know to the invite. Um, I'm happy to add you, or if there's someone on your team that's new and joined us that you want included on there, send, up, send their email my way. And apologies in advance, because I know whenever I change the list, either adding or removing people or both, every single person that's on the list gets an updated email. So just see it as a little note of me saying hi. So that's it. We're... Um, we're in the final stretch here, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Emily. And thank you all for 
making e and &E as successful as it's been and um, for continuing on our e and &E journey at this point, which has been three years, three years long. And uh, we got at least two more in the future. So um, thanks for hopping on the e and &E train with us. Um, if you're not seeing, I, I feel like everywhere we're seeing the effects of um, how successful this grant's been and um, centers opening and, and everything like that. So we're super excited. Um, all right, I'm going next. Uh, so let me present real quick. All right, cool. So I just have a few uh, bullet points to go over. Um, you may have seen our uh, contract email come into your inboxes for this year. Um, and we, yeah, we were told we have a pretty tight turnaround. And so we try to get this out as quickly as possible. Um, things do look a little bit different this year, but not so different. So we're hoping we're able to uh, manage these changes together. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a few of those changes and, um, we can always, um, get back to, you know, you can always reach out to us if you have, um, additional questions after we go over this. Um, can everyone just be here? I'm going to unmute all. All right, cool. Um, so first off, um, there are there's some new federal regulations around uh, our indirect charging and modified total direct costs. Um, so, you know, we we finally got used to where we can't charge more than twenty five thousand dollars per contractor for uh, two indirects. So you can only charge up to the first twenty five thousand um, dollars. We have been told that this is now for the lifetime of the contract. So if you have the same contractor year after year, um, after you've charged that first $25,000 to indirect one year, you can no longer do it to the same contractor the following year or any year going forward, I believe for five, up to five years. Um, so me on our finance team has worked to, um, has worked to, um, Kind of highlight that in the budget and that's why the budget looks a little bit different um yes lisa what's up so when you say that you just said if you already reach the twenty five thousand and stop charging in direct in one year you can't charge in direct the next my question is if i charge ten thousand one year ten thousand in another year and then five thousand the following year am i do i need to track it like that so that it's twenty five thousand over a period of time and not just within one year Yes, you're welcome to track it like that. Okay, so it does have to be. Yep. Yeah, okay, I see. The, I see the little things coming up that says yes, you're right. So we have to track. Once you hit twenty five thousand at all within a five year period, you're done. That's it. Yep. Got exactly. It. Great clarifying question. I'm happy I could answer. It. <laughs> uh, yes, starting this year. So um, you know, you can anyone who you charged last year, you can also. Um, charge them this year if you need to. All right. Um, sorry, someone needs to come in. Sorry, I have one sorry. more grant uh, question. Yes. Is what's that twenty five thousand per funding source, or twenty five thousand across all funding sources? Across all funding sources, okay. I believe, because it's per the the contract budget. I believe that's it. correct, Charlie. Um, I see this being a bigger issue with coaches and or EQIT. Yes. Um, although, you know, those budgets look a little bit different as well. Um, all right, I'm going to keep moving down, but um, keep questions in mind and um, we'll try to get to them. Um, we have about we have a little bit extra time here. Um, okay, so the second update is we got notice yesterday that um, we cannot include gift cards on any of our CDC contracts. Um, it's kind of a black and white. We can't include gift cards on them. So um, just FYI, um, 
as you know, we have a deadline of March 1st. Um, just, you know, really try your hardest. Obviously, there are extenuating circumstances, and we know uh, gift cards starting with next year's contracts. Um, they're going to put language in the contract um, per federal federal regulation. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so, yes, uh, deadline of 3-1. Please try your hardest. We know there are extenuating circumstances, um, but the finance requirements are, are, you know, there are a few more hoops that we have to jump through with contracts these days. Um, so just try your best, work with your um, coordinator, you know, if you need to set up like a special meeting, you know, 10 or 15 minute check in to go over all the contract stuff, we're happy to do that with you. Um, but just try your hardest to stick to that deadline. Um, we have two separate columns now for the AOC, and, oh, that, sorry, that's supposed to say uh, Family Child Care Navigator funding, or no, that's right, AOC and CCR funding, keep those separate because we do have to spend down that AOC funding by September 30th. So uh, we wanna keep them in separate columns so we're able to track that spending. Um, we have a folder in our, um, in the folder that was sent, this contract document folder, for subrecipient forms, don't worry about that. We will be filling those forms out for you. Um, like Emily mentioned with E&E, there will likely be additional provisions once it's time to sign the contract, but um, don't worry about those subrecipient forms in that folder. Um, and last but not least, you know, we, we're, we're really trying, I think we're all on the same page. We really wanna secure more funding to continue the amazing work that you've been able to do these past two years um, with the additional funding that we've had. And I know it's like for, I know it's been like life-changing work, really. It's it's changed families' lives, providers' lives to be able to get you guys in there more um, to provide the support that's really needed to work with FFN. Um, so we're all on the same page. We're really trying to get this funding. Um, there are a lot of asks from our department this year and we're just hoping for the best. Um, and you know the the minute we find out that we have it we'll let you know and we'll get amendments going to get that funding into your contracts um but this is what we have for now and um you know we're gonna hope for the best please reach out to your coordinator with any questions i had to put my little gift in there for some comic relief <laughs> um all right so a couple questions here um or how do we reflect the AOC FCCH funding without impacting overall percentages? So I think it's thinking about what percentage of their overall annual time is going to be spent on those funding streams. Yeah, Julia, I have reached out to um, the finance team and I'm still waiting to hear back from them on how they are suggesting that you guys do that for the budgets. Um, so as soon as I hear back, I will we'll put together a communication to share with everybody so that everyone knows how to allocate for this three months worth of work without it getting all wonky with the 100% and the percentiles that are going in because it is only three months and not 12 months. All right, let's see. Um, do you know if the no gift card rule applies to UPK contracts too? From what I understand, this is uh, CDEC wide, starting with next year's um, fiscal year, starting next fiscal year. But um, I don't want to, I don't want to speak on behalf of UPK. But from the communication we received, it was uh, CDEC wide due to federal guidelines. Um, for now, we have put stuff into two line items, one for three most and one for 12. Yeah. Um, what can we do to help with that advocacy? Um, it, it never hurts to to reach out, you know, let us send us testimonials about how, how providers have been affected um, positively by the extra funding or how, you know, the things your council have been able to do. Um, our leadership does read those things and you know that i can't say that that's gonna influence the jbc or you know how much pull that has but i know that 
um, the more communication that we can provide about the work that we're doing, the better. And it's just, it's, it's always good um, to have that information too, so. So also, Lisa, reach out to your state reps because um, it's the state representatives that are the ones that are discussing this. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they need to know the importance of the work and they only know what they know. They and so it's, you know, it's a matter of us giving them that feedback as well that, you know, why this money matters. Right. Are there any other questions on contracts? I know, I know um, you haven't had a lot of time to look at them. And, and so we're here, we're, we're here with you. Ask us questions. We're, um, we're here to help you guys do those, do, uh, put these together and, and make these happen. Yes, Lana, what's up? Um, I was curious, was anybody else having issues with the formulas working in the spreadsheet? Cause I, I might just email you Charlie and see, cause mine aren't like adding up at the end. So yeah, okay. some of the formulas are not in the supply and, uh, travel. Okay. Yes, please, please send me an email with uh, the specifics, and I'll get that to Jeannie. I know she, she like whipped up these <laughs> budgets like really quick once we found out about the MTDC. Um, so I, there's definitely a chance that there could have been an error. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Right. Um, please reach out with any additional questions. I'm going to pass the baton over to Lilith, who just has a real quick update on um, some really exciting work. So thank you all. Thanks for your patience and your support and partnership with these contracts. And we're looking forward to another great year working together. <laughs> all right. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, so I just have some quick updates. Lilith, you're on mute. Yay. No, it's okay. I'll stand. Um, <laughs> okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Sorry. Cool. That might have been uh, let's, let's try to make up some of that time. So I'm just giving a quick update on um, that whole project to trans transition sugar functionality to Salesforce. Um, so uh, the basically the purpose of this project was to try and have things all in one space. Um, yes. <laughs> um, to try and have things all in one space and to make sure that our data analysis, um, anything we have to do for uh, audit controls, things like that, that we can tighten them up a little bit um, and also eliminate some integration issues. Um, we love sugar. We love what it's done for us. We also know it's kind of a Frankenstein sometimes and it's built with many, many different pieces. And um, we're just wanting at the state to have a more um, um, like whole piece that uh, providers can use uh, to log their spending for uh, coaching records to be kept, um, just everything kind of in one place. So, mm -hmm. so a couple of updates so far. Um, so we are currently working with the development team, uh, working on this first version of the system. Um, we hope to, what we want to launch this on July 1. Um, and we know that like with anything, any updates, any new things, there will be minor challenges and um, there will be uh, enhancements that are expected to come, but we want something that you can use um, and that's going to be um, good for your programs, good for your council and does you know exactly what you're doing now, hopefully with a little bit more intuitive um, processes. Um, we will have technical support and trainings available and support documents for councils and providers. And when we are ready for user testing, we're not quite there yet, but when we are ready, we will definitely be reaching out to councils. P please feel free um, to reach out to your coordinator if you're interested and all of those people interested will be passed to me so I can get the development team on that as well. Um, so those are just some quick updates. I know it isn't a lot, but I just want to make sure, um, you know, we are 
doing everything we can to get this ready and making sure that it's it's something that's whole and complete and comes out and is useful to you as a council. And so I'm really excited um, about sharing this. And that are all my updates right now. Uh, yes, Lisa. Uh, I was just curious if you think that the application on the provider program side will not be available until July 1 or might it be available earlier? Um, and when you say application, you mean for QI funding? Yes. That should go live July 1. Yeah. Okay. That's mm -hmm. just good to know now. Thank you. Yes. And I know there's probably still some questions, but like I said, we're really working through this um, to make sure that you have something that, that just is a is a seamless transition um so it isn't going to be uh, maybe the bells and whistles that you know we'd want for our birthdays but it's going to be a, a really nice inclusive piece that really brings everything towards the hub and towards the qras piece and kind of ties all of that together so that's all i got and if you do have additional questions please feel to reach out um, to either me or your qras coordinator we can get um, some more definitive answers. And yeah, that's all I got. Yes, reporting overall will be lovely. <laughs> As the parent of two young boys, we don't need any more whistles or bells. <laughs> the second they get a hand on their hands on a whistle, um, <laughs> they don't stop. Um, all right, cool. Uh, we have our SSBI unit here to give us some updates. Thank you, Charlie, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kristen Lang with our State Systems Building Initiatives Unit at the Department of Early Childhood here with um, my wonderful colleagues, Megan and Marika, to provide some updates uh, for you all today. Um, Marika, if you'll go to the next slide. Uh, just some wanted to start with some high level overall updates on our PDG B5 planning grant, and that's our preschool development grant, birth through five planning grant. Um, so next slide, please, Marika. Many of you have been involved in and are aware that our whole state has been working really hard on updating our early childhood needs assessment um, for the full state. And I'm excited to tell you that we expect both the English and Spanish version of the new updated needs assessment to be released in March. So that has been um, a full year now that <laughs> that's been in process. So we're really excited. Um, to share that back with you all and, and reflect back what our families and providers and system partners said were top of mind for Colorado. Um, the second thing I wanted to just give a quick update on is another initiative that many of you have been very closely involved with um, over the last, I'd say, nine months, which is updating our statewide early childhood strategic plan. And just as a reminder, um, this plan is one that belongs to the full state. It reflects our shared priorities um, and is intended to be picked up and implemented by partners at all levels of the system. Um, and we have a title for it now, which is exciting. Um, that's Elevating Early Childhood. That is in our internal clearance process right now. So we are anticipating um, endorsement by the ECLC in April, and then of course, public release in English and Spanish around the same time. So really looking forward to getting those important foundational documents for our system out to you and for you all to have them and have time to sit and consider how within your role at the local level, um, you can work on these needs and advance these shared priorities of our systems um, and certainly where work that you already do is is meeting that um, meeting that need and advancing those strategies so um exciting to finally be toward the toward the finish line on that um, also wanted to just flag for you that, you know, in, in grant land, of course, they've got to call everything something weird. So our annual programmatic performance review, which, you know, doesn't mean a whole lot for PDGB5, um, is 
going to be available in April, but really what that is is a report that tells you what we did in 2023. Um, yes, APPR. Um, so we acknowledge that there's just a lot of work going on across the state all the time. Um, and we're continuing to think about how we can make our work more visible on an ongoing basis. Certainly coming here and talking to you all is one way that we do that. Um, but there are lots of activities we don't get to. And so uh, this is a great way to just catch up on what's going on with PDG for now. And I am hopeful that we'll have in an even more engaging and dynamic manner other than a federal report to give you updates um, coming soon. So stay tuned uh, and uh, I w almost ended and I guess I will with don't, it'll be a little while before we have uh, anything like that in place, but it'll, um, for now this report, it provides a good overview. Okay, next slide. So I'm taking, a bit too long talking with my friends here. Okay, um, so the other thing I wanted to uh, elevate to you all is that our federal partners are releasing a new opportunity for PDGB5 renewal grant funding. Um, our last renewal grant just ended at the end of December of 2023. We're in a no cost extension year of our current planning grant. Um, so this is expected to be a three-year funding opportunity from 2024 to 2027 for our state. Somewhere they're saying between 500,000 to $8.5 million is what they anticipate awarding. That's lower than in prior rounds of this grant, um, but this is all very TBD because the funding announcement has not been released and they don't know what Congress will or will not do in terms of budget. So we'll see what's coming, but in the meantime, we're trying to prepare uh, to put an application together. One that's competitive and innovative and really digs into um, the systems building nature of the preschool development grant, Birth Through Five. So, so far, um, what we did was take a look at that updated draft early childhood strategic plan, since it reflects the shared priorities of our full system, we said, which of these strategies best align with our PDGB5 theory of change, which has four key outcomes in the areas of accessible, access and affordability, workforce systems alignment, and family engagement. We um, created a subset of strategies from there that we sorted for effort and impact and then developed high level activities for. Um, we're now having our leadership prioritize those high level activities. And the prioritization is so that those activities can then be more fully developed into strategy concepts. And we're going to do that with our partners, which means very likely many of you um, will be hearing from us in the next month or so to say, hey, we wanna take this activity idea, which is a couple sentences at this point, and really think about what would be the best way to implement this in the state. We heard from you all uh, through our last PDG renewal grant that you really appreciated the partnership in implementation, but had hoped to have been at the table for the strategy development. And so that's what we're trying to fix with this round is to invite everybody in to brainstorm what those strategies should look like from the get go um, that might ultimately go into the application. Whether they make it into the application totally depends on what that final notice of funding opportunity looks like and, and what the right mix um, is going to be for CDEC's capacity. Um, but I'm excited uh, that we'll be able to engage in that brainstorming process with you all soon. So more to come on that and I'll pass it over to I think Megan next. Yes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Megan LeClaire. I'm also on the State Systems Building Initiatives team at CDEC. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of updates. So first, um, I know you all have heard me talk about Project Include before, um, but this is a project that originally started um, through P sort of through PDG, but it started in 2021. And this is in conjunction with the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering at CU Denver. Um, and this is a project that is open to all licensed uh, child care providers in the state, and they can fill out an interest form and get connected uh, with subject matter experts at the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering to learn how to better adapt their materials and environments to be more inclusive for all children. And so if you'll go to the next one, Marika, 
Um, this has been highly anticipated. So we're so excited to share that we have a new kit available. This is an infant kit. So before we had um, four topic area kits and we still have them available, um, behavior and cognition, fine and gross motor, vision and hearing and um, early literacy. But uh, this is an infant specific kit. And so it kind of combines a lot of the um, themes from the topic kits, but it's infant focused. And so um, thanks, Marika. She just put the link to the Project Include website in the chat. So um, a lot of you are very familiar with these kits because as you know, a lot of you have become partners with us um, in housing these kits and helping with distributing them across local communities. So thank you all so much for um, being a partner and champion of this work because we know that so many um, so many providers and, and educators and folks in the workforce just need some more support for um, working with children of all abilities and just managing challenging behaviors and, and getting supports into the classroom um, in ways that maybe they didn't have training or funding for previously. So I just put on here a little chart uh, of the steps and this is just pulled from the website. So if you go onto their website, you'll see the same thing. But um, there's really like a multi-step process um, for requesting a kit. So this is for providers, obviously for um, councils, your involvement will, will look a little different, but the step-by-step -step process is for if a provider wants to check out a kit. Um, and so we're working on incentivizing each of these steps for providers to kind of get them more excited about going through the phase, the multi-phase process, because it, it can look cumbersome, but it's actually pretty easy. Um, so we're just trying to uh, demystify some of that assumption. But, and then you can also see it's pretty small, but there's a picture of the infant kit. So that's everything that is included um, in the kit and providers can check these out and um, kind of loan, it's like a loan system. So they can try all these materials out. They have many opportunities to earn materials to keep in their program too, through working with, with SIDE. So um, please share, uh, share this info. I know we don't have a flyer or anything for you, but you can share the website. Um, we are working on getting something written up to put into newsletters, but you all are the first audience that we've shared this with. So um, hot off the press. And thank you so much for uh, your help. So that's it for Project Include. I'm going to go to the next uh, topic. Yes, Lisa, it is very exciting. Um, and okay, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the local organizational capacity work, which again, many of you are familiar with um, and have participated in 2023 through the regional convenings that we offered um, or um, and or the virtual training series we also offered through this work last year. So next slide, Marika. Um, as some of you probably have already heard, we want you all to save the date. Um, if you are a current local organizational capacity um, PDG grantee, so if you're one of the local teams or on one of the local teams that uh, participated in this work in 2023, then you know who you are. But we are holding one event this spring um, that will bring all of the teams from the four regions we visited last year together. So um, instead of holding four additional events like we did across the state, we're going to do one centralized event and it's going to be in Colorado Springs, April 29th and 30th. So we're just asking you all to hold those dates um, and more information will come we are working with our incredible event planners um, that helped us lift this work last year. And so excited we get to partner with them again. And this will be very similar in format to the events we held last year. So it will be a two day event with um, some professional development, learning opportunities around supporting families with infants and toddlers. And then it will be an opportunity for you all to share your work um, that you've been using the mini grant funds for and um, that will be really exciting to have an opportunity to network with one another and hear uh, what regions are doing in this space so we are so excited to have the opportunity to connect again and look forward to seeing you there if you're able to make it 
So stay tuned. We'll we'll reach out with more info, especially regarding um, lodging and mileage and things like that. So stay tuned. Hi everyone, Marika Padilla here in the same unit as Kristen and Megan. And I am going to give just brief updates on that childcare business training and transitions to kindergarten marketplace. So we are excited to share with you all that there are two business trains coming up in March. They're both open for registration and I checked this morning, there's lots of seats available. So the first one is hosted by the East Colorado SBDC. It is for home-based providers uh, running from March 4th to March 25th. And thanks, Megan, for dropping those registration links in there. And another one is the North Metro Denver SBDCs, and this is for both center and home-based providers. And that's running from late March to late April. So this is coming up soon. And then we, again, wanted to share with you all the registration to the third annual Southern Colorado Early Childhood Business Conference that it will be held at the Pueblo Community College on April 27th. It's a Saturday from nine to three. Um, it's a no cost to providers. We are gonna be serving breakfast and lunch and providers can also earn up to four hours of PDIS credit. So um, great opportunity to learn uh, what's going on uh, with the new uh, PDIS platform and um, universal preschool program. Okay, place to learn those. And um, there's also a link to register and you can also scan the QR code if you have your phone handy. And then I just wanted to remind everyone of the new Transitions to Kindergarten Marketplace. Um, it is a great resource uh, to support uh, programs and communities to support uh, transitions to uh, kindergarten work. Uh, there's also the webinar recording from the January 18th webinar that we held uh, with the staff from the National P3 Center, who is our partner with this work. And there's also a spot uh, in the marketplace for you all to upload if you have any great transitions to kindergarten or tra general transitions on the terrace to share with, with other communities. And then I wanted to highlight the link that Megan just dropped into the chat. We are still taking requests to print copies of some of the transitions to kindergarten resources. So what we currently have to offer in print form is the what we call the roadmap. So it's the transitions to kindergarten in Colorado, the roadmap. So that's available request for print copies, as well as the new resource that we just developed with Marzano Research. It's called Supporting Children with Special Health Conditions. And that resource is available in print in both English and Spanish. So um, please send out requests if you'd like to uh, get any of these printed materials for your programs. And we thank you all as usual for uh, listening to our presentations. Anyone have any questions to me, Megan, or Kristen? All right, thank you. Our contact information is in the chat, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, SSBI. Ooh, there's so many exciting things going on. I, I hope. Uh, I hope uh, folks on here are taking advantage of some of these really cool initiatives. That infant, uh, that infant kit looks amazing. So many cool toys in there and things to to grow the young minds. Um, let's see. We have Christy up next. Hi, Christy. Hi, everyone. I'm Christy Russler. I'm the Stabilization Grants Manager. I don't have any slides. This is just a quick update or quick um, announcement. Uh, for you to just be watching your emails over the next couple of weeks because we're going to be opening a spring bonus payment um, for anyone that received at least one stabilization or one new provider success grant payment. Um, we will determine the amounts based on um, that application rate. So we really want people to apply so that the most number of providers can receive this spring bonus. We're also going to be opening up um, a second round of health and mental health. If you remember uh, fall of 2022, 
the health and mental health grant opened and closed in five days because of the response. So we're very excited to have funds um, available again for the health and mental health grant. And it'll be run the same as it was um, a year and a half ago um, with the list of options of ways that per, uh, providers can use those health and mental health dollars. Um, thank you, Emily, for this shout out. <laughs> And then um, we are also looking to um, open up the licensing incentive bonus. Uh, we're still working on that, so more information will be coming. Um, like I said, at the beginning of my announcement, just watch your emails, watch for the um, February CDEC newsletter. Uh, we're hoping for a press release too. We really wanna get the word out about uh, these initiatives. So does anybody have any questions for me before? I sign off. Hey, Christy, real quick, just to verify. So the licensing incentive bonus, it's not going to be an ongoing um, program process, if you will. We just had some identified funding that would allow us to pay the licensing incentive bonus to anyone who got, who missed it the first mm -hmm. time that would have been eligible. And like going forward through, I think it's March or April of this year, we're still trying to, like Christy said, work out some of the details. But um, just so you know that it's more of a catch up process than it is an ongoing, but still a really, we're really excited about it. Yes, we're really uh, grateful that we are going to be able to try to get this licensing incentive bonus to anybody that missed it and also anybody that has gotten, gotten licensed after June 30th of 23. We'll have all of those dates and all of those specifics uh, once the communication starts going out. Um, any other questions? Uh, we haven't said the amount just yet. I think we're leaning toward it being the same amount. Karen, do you have any, any additional information? Yeah, that's what we're shooting for is to keep the amounts the same as they were. And we should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we'll be sure you guys to keep you in the loop of all the communication because we know you're going to be our integral parts to connect um, this information, uh, especially with our navigators um, in the in the providers that they uh, are working with. So we just want anyone and everyone who's eligible to get these funds. There is about there's a lot. There's almost twenty seven million dollars yeah between the yeah. stabilization new provider success licensing incentive and the health and mental yeah. health so yeah okay that's it for me thank you thank you christy i know there will be lots of providers very excited about this um all right Cool, we are on track. So we have uh, Terry Penny. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. Cool. Nice to see you again, Terry. And um, hey, I'll, I'll let you take it away. Hi, everybody. My name is Terry Penny. Let me share my screen. I'm with the Colorado Department of Education, too. I, no, I'm with Department of Early Childhood, too. And some of you, I've been making the rounds. Some of you have seen this presentation, and I'm sorry about that. Um, so bear with me. I'm going to be quick. Um, but it's about tax credits and getting money into the hands of families with young children. And I think that's really important. And this is a good year. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. We can see the slideshow, but it's not in slideshow mode. Yes, I can see that. Why isn't it working? Start slideshow. There we go. Okay. So as you know, Times have been tough in Colorado for families. Uh, child poverty rate has been hanging out at about 11%, but inflation has been taking its bite out of families' pockets. 
housing costs are out of control in Colorado. And as you also know, economic need is tied to poor health and educational outcomes. And we want to combat that with tax credits and rebates. Credits are decreases in taxes owed, but you don't even have to owe tax taxes to get some tax credits because they're refundable and you get them back in a check or direct deposit. Now, tax rebates are refunds of taxes paid. In Colorado, we mostly know this as, ta as TABOR rebates. Tax credits really matter. Next to Social Security, they are the best way of getting children out of poverty. SNAP is great, WIC is great, PANF is great, but tax credits are even better for families. They reduce infant mortality and low birth weight. They reduce child maltreatment and reliance on child welfare system. They improve health. They improve educational and earnings outcomes across generations. So young children whose families get tax credits when they're little, they do better throughout their lifetime. It's really amazing. Tax credits have been studied for years. But the problem in Colorado is that a full quarter, 25% of folks who are eligible are not getting the tax credits they deserve. These are very low income families. These are folks who aren't filing their taxes to begin with because they don't have to, they don't make enough, but you have to file to get these refundable tax credits. Also new, new parents and grandparents who are caring for their grandchildren aren't necessarily filing because they don't know about these tax credits. Our newcomer friends, immigrant and refugee folks aren't necessarily filing. Government distrust is a big problem, as you know. Um, so we need to help families get over that distrust. Non-English speaking communities aren't filing as much and rural families aren't filing as much. This is who we want to reach out to this year. What's new this year? So the child tax credit is $2,000 if you owe taxes, but even if you don't, 1,600 of that is refundable. And that's on the federal side. Then Colorado will come in and match that 10 to 60%. Now here's what's great about this tax credit. The parent does not need a social security number. The child does, but the parent can use something called an ITIN, it's a, it's a taxpayer number. You have to file to paperwork to get it, but, but you can do that and still get this tax credit. And you may have heard in the news that Congress is in the process of passing an expanded child tax credit like they had during the pandemic that would increase this even more. So stay tuned for that. And that would um, include the 2023 tax year. So it could mean even more money. The other biggie this year is the earned income tax credit, which is up to $7,430 for those bigger families with multiple children. Then this year only Colorado's coming in and is going to match that 50%. So now we're up to about $10,000 for our bigger families. That is real money. Haber this year is at $800 for filing singly, $1,600 jointly. But the deal is you have to file your Colorado taxes to get the Tabor refund. You might remember in the past, we were just getting checks during the pandemic. Not going to happen this time. You actually have to file. So you have to file federal and state. And then also, I, I think your providers all know this, but I just want to remind them that if they have an early childhood credential from CDEC, they can get the early childhood educator tax credit. Now, there are also income limits and you have to have worked for a licensed eligible program last year, but that's up to 1620 for the, the higher level credential. Yes, I know, it's very exciting. It, and about 26,000 um, educators do have their credential this year, so they, they should be eligible. If they don't have their credential, don't worry, they can get it now and still file for the next two tax years. So it's not over yet, and it's just gonna go up and up and up even more. Oh, I see Brenda clapping, yes, yay. So what are we asking the early childhood communities to do? We're asking your providers who are trusted people in the community. We're asking your, your navigators, anyone, your coaches, whoever works in community with families, 
just to ask families, hey, have you filed your taxes? Have, have you received tax credits? We're not asking anyone to be a tax expert or help people file their taxes. That's way too much. But you can refer folks. One way to refer them is to this awesome website called Get Ahead Colorado. It is also in Spanish, asiaadelantecolorado.org. And this website is kind of a one-stop shop for folks to file their taxes safely, securely, and for free. On the one hand, it'll tell them, like I just did, you about the, the tax credits they may be eligible for. They can kind of see, oh yeah, I, I might be eligible for this one, this one, this one. Then they can learn how to file their taxes. There are a couple of websites. If families are at all internet savvy, they can go online and file their taxes for free. If they want help filing their taxes in person, there is a map and a spreadsheet of VITA sites. These are volunteer income tax assistance sites. These are places where people are trained by the IRS to help people file their taxes. You can make up to about $64,000 and still get help for free. These VITA sites are very trustworthy. They do just as good work, if not better work, than the paid sites. We don't want families to have to shell out hundreds of dollars to get their taxes done. They can trust the VITA sites. And then for folks like you, there is something on this website called the Partner Toolkit. Here are flyers and posters and social media blurbs and newsletter blurbs, all free, ready for you to print or copy or email or use however you want. And one of the coolest things on here is that um, in 19 languages, there is a doc, a tax document checklist. You know how you have to get all your documents in order in order to file your taxes? Well, what is that list of things I need? We have it here for you in 19 languages that you can give out to families. So please get the word out this year. It's a good year to file your taxes for both providers and then providers to tell families um, and, and get your hundreds, if not thousands of dollars back. Any questions? Thanks, Karen. All right, I'll just put the website in the chat. Please check it out. And Terry, if you can just email me the presentation, I'll make sure that it's in our follow-up resources as well. If you're talking, you are muted. Talking anymore. Up oh, I'm there. Done. Now we okay, cool, cool. Thank you so much, Terry. Thanks for hopping on and, and joining us. And um, yeah, let's get the word across there and save some parents some money and some educators some money. All right. I see uh, I see you up above me, Rick. Welcome. We have uh, Rick and Monica from Thrive here to uh, chat with us about some resources. Terry, uh, you might have to stop presenting. Click the stop presenting button. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having us. You'll be hearing from me. I'm Monica and Rick throughout our time together today. And Rick, you can go to the next slide. So I want to introduce to some and reintroduce to others um, Thrive. And so really we focus on developing solutions and partnering with people to make sure that children have quality. And not only that, that we look at the best practice standards that we can utilize in serving children and families. And we practice in typically four areas. So one, people, how do we support teams and staff to do their best, collaborate, and deliver quality services? 
what systems, policies, and practices are really important to have in place so people can do their best? What do we need to do to keep children safe? Um, it's something that we don't like to think about, but it's been several challenges as of late with intruders in reference to coming in buildings and hurting people. So what does that look like? Not only equipment, but the systems or the practices that we need to have. And then the last is facility design and maintenance. How do we not only think about inspiring environments, but safe environments, and how do we design them and how do we maintain them once we make those large investments? And then our approach, our, our approach is always to listen and collaborate. We feel that our partners always have the best thoughts about how to come up with solutions. So we love to work in partnership and recognize culture and history and the voices of the people that are to be served. And then those are just us. So <laughs> that's just reiterating, it's Rick and Monica here with you today. And I'm the director of Thrive and Rick is our facilities coordinator. So thanks for the shout outs. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Monica. Uh, just to give an update on on the the project we've been uh, teaming up with the, the Department of Early Childhood, Colorado's Department of Childhood, is uh, some of the comprehensive facility technical assistance support regarding the uh, ENE &E grant, the uh, Emerging and Expanding Grant for facilities, and uh, some of the things that we are we have been offering uh, the consultation uh, through either telephone or video email. Uh, discuss any facility uh, concerns that you may have in, in either uh, expanding your project, doing any renovations, uh, what is it that you need to do to undertake this project uh, from the, you know, whether you're a very beginner or seasoned uh, contractor, constructor, or you've done this before, but sometimes there are certain nuances to the project uh, that you may have questions on, that's what we made ourselves available. Uh, one of the things that we are putting together, uh, and we, we, we are going to go over just a little bit on them, is these guidebooks, and we call these guidebooks for the Family Child Care Home and Center-Based Care. These are just basic information about the processes uh, that you may be able to use to prepare and implement your facility project. And a lot of that is going to have an emphasis on the state and county or city uh, regulations. Uh, specifically with uh, the, uh, as it relates to health and safety and the best practices uh, in the early child education environments. So again, to kind of recap on the cost intelligent topics, that could be a lot of things. For example, uh, you know, if you have questions about building codes or zoning in your jurisdiction, permitting, how to, how to find how to find the answers you need, uh, any things about any uh, ideas about licensing, where to point you towards to. Uh, ADA compliance questions are often uh, asked a lot. What do you do with contracts? You know, how many bits you need, or is the bid good enough? Is this, is this bid going to work for me? Uh, did I put the the right scope of work in it? Uh, how to obtain those bids? What the price is looking like? So questions of that sort, uh, we'll be glad to kind of give you some guidance, uh, including also oversight of construction, the actual renovation, what to expect, uh, even uh, some ideas on how to select your contractor if you're a little nervous or just not sure how to go about selecting the right contractor for your project, contractor that meets, uh, that fits your uh, your needs as well. And that also goes so far also to um, any design professional that you may need, whether it's an interior designer or if you need an architect, how to go about selecting those and maybe, you know, what questions to ask them once you have selected a, a couple to interview. Uh, of course, there's always questions about insurance, how to track cost, and a lot of times, you know, does my project really qualify as a capital improvement project or is it a, you know, is it just a maintenance project? So questions of that sort, we're here for you on the consultation topics. As far as the guidebooks are concerned, uh, they do have a purpose and they are basically a desk reference uh, to inform you on how to navigate the many layers of a qualifying construction project uh, with the Emerging Expanding Grant. And it wants to present to you the fundamentals and the practical knowledge to, to effectively plan, to manage, and have some sort of accountability in your project, how to go through it uh, to completion and, and be successful at it. 
Uh, one thing that the guidebook is not going to do, it's not going to be a substitute for, you know, like we said, design professionals. If you need one, you will have to be able to contract one yourself, but we will be glad to help you select one or help you find how to select one. Uh, again, this is, uh, we give you some advice in the guidebooks that may allude a little bit to some legal uh, ramifications, but it is not going to be a substitute for any real legal counsel, which will leave that up to uh the uh, provider or the owner of the facility so the two books are uh, very similar uh, a lot of the things about construction are very fundamental to whether it's a very small project and you find a child care home or is it a little bit more involved or complex in a child care center for example but we've broken down uh some uh into different sections five different sections uh specifically to identify agencies what regulations really for project compliance apply to you uh, in assessing the existing conditions. Uh, the assessing six existing conditions would be the almost the first step to define whether your project is a capital project, what sort of things you may need to really uh, look at in your existing building to define what may be a project. It could be a, a, a bathroom renovation, but if, if you find out there's other things that are going to affect it, then you need to know what that scope of work is going to develop into. So those things we want to make sure that we give you some advice on. Uh, that becomes part of section two, the strategy to renovate. That also kind of gives you some guidance on creating a scope of work. And we also give you some additional considerations in the renovation of family child care homes. Some other things to think about. Uh, there are things that maybe you think it, it needs to be a capital project, but it may just be a maintenance project. You know, how to kind of pinpoint some of those things before you really get involved. Uh, section four, develop into construction bu budget. Uh, we give you some pointers as to what sort of things you need to include as you prepare your budget. You know, it's not just the construction piece, it's a lot of other items that play and plug and play into, into your project that you that we think you need to know and beforehand as you plan because a project may grow on you. And, uh, you know, we call that pri uh, uh, scope uh, creep. Uh, it may grow on you, but it may not need to grow on you as long as you have all the right tools to decide what your project may be. So we do give you that. And of course, the section five would be navigating the required inspections of the project. Once you have your project, what sort of inspections are you expected to do? What sort of things you need the uh, building inspector for? If you have an architect, what is what is his responsibility? What sort of things he needs to be looking at? So you are aware of those things as well. And we also include uh, about six appendices uh, those are uh, pretty self-evident on the, the early childhood councils. Uh, considerations for bidding and requirements, we give you some pointers. Uh, what sort of building codes are relevant in your county or jurisdiction? Again, we have four and five is how to select the architect and the general contractor. We'll give you some pointers that I was mentioning before. And the key components of a construction contract. Once you've got it all figured out, how do you have that contract set it set up? So you know what you're getting and all and the responsibilities of each part of the contract, what sort of things to expect. So some 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 broken down ideas as to what to look for. And in, in this couple of sections, just give you a little uh, little preview of what the, the reading looks like for each of the sections. Uh, they're they're uh, laid out in, uh, in, in outline style um, items, as you've seen in other documents that are in blue. Are very likely to be links. So if you click on those, it will automatically take you to a, uh, a link on the internet uh, to give you additional information uh, for that topic. And for example, section three, you know, what are some of the additional considerations? You know, we, we, we kind of give you some pointers on the exterior building maintenance, you know, roof inspection, exterior painting, or what do you need for your HVAC systems maintenance? any safety check that you may need to make sure you include the, the sort of things. Uh, again, for developing a construction project, we were talking about some ideas to have so you know what to include in your cost. You know, if you need to have professional services, if you need to have site preparation, what sort of things you'd lo be looking for as far as budget is concerned and so forth. And then section five, of course, is an example of navigating the required inspections, again, some of the pointers uh, easy to read in an outline form and bullet form uh, to keep it pretty easy reading.
And of course, uh, like I said, we, we are uh, available to you. Uh, we, I'm actually uh, located in, in Central Standard Time, so you can call me at your convenience past, uh, you know, we know, we understand that providers are working to late in the afternoon. So uh, if it's if it's after five o'clock your time, six o'clock my time, feel free to contact us via email or, uh, or, or telephone, as you see on your screen, that's 720-747-5110 or our email, which is pretty easy, makes you hungry, thrive taco at thrivecb.org. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a nice catchy email address for you. But again, we're available to you uh, for any facility needs during the E&E grant. Are there any initial questions? Lisa, you have a question? Uh, my question is <clears throat> really related to the number of newer programs that have come along that are interested in doing something to have a facility. And so they're not really going to qualify for E&E, but they need some guidance or direction that is beyond my scope of uh, expertise. So I'm curious whether or not it's a matter of either providing this resource and giving them the reality that this isn't going to qualify them for the E&E grant, but may help them with their project, or what your recommendations are for for these ones coming along. Yeah, Lisa, um, thank you so much for that question, mm -hmm. Monica. I'm happy to jump in. So um, we have our contract with Thrive through the end of September, I believe. So with that, um, we could consider these providers applicants in that sense and they could call thrive if they had any questions through that point in time um this is going to be a living document on the cdec website so if it's beyond that point in time definitely we can get them this resource so that they have the tools needed um to go forward kind of beyond the e and e timeline super thank you so very much Any other and, questions? And while folks are thinking of questions, I know our team here at CDC's had the opportunity to work closely with Rick and Monica on these guides. So they're really thorough and I think they will help folks know what questions to be asking without going into too much detail, if that makes sense. So it's a really, I think it'll be a really great resource for Colorado and for current and future child care providers. If not any other questions, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Rick and Monica. Thank you. Good to meet. I haven't worked with you personally, but I've heard amazing things and um, we really appreciate your support through e &E. I know it's been so nice having you to uh, kind of lean on for these questions that are totally out of our scope. So thank you for partnering with us and making this grant as successful as it's been. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right. We have Elaine and possibly Jennifer McDonald, but definitely Elaine here um, to talk. Ooh. Jennifer's here uh, to talk about uh, some really exciting PDIS updates. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, trying to get my screen. There we go. Um, so we are back with installation three of PDIS user interface updates for you all. Um, and we have a date to share with everyone today. Um, so we will be making all of these updates um, kind of live on Sunday, March 10th. Um, so you can expect some downtime in the system. Um, it, we're expecting that it would just it will just be the morning of Sunday the 10th, but um, we're just kind of holding the day just for anything that would come up. Um, and then starting Monday the 11th, you will see our beautiful new system. Um, so we are, we'll be sharing this information out as far and as wide as we can. 
um, but please share it with your networks um, as well. So the PDIS will be unavailable for planned updates on Sunday, March 10th, while we change to our new user interface. Um, and I will send this link to our demo schedule as well in the chat. Um, it is the same link for our, the demo schedules that we've been sharing out. Um, so with that being said, today I am sharing what the, the third part of our new user interface design, which is the learning side. Um, so we have seen, so, um, sorry, kind of step back and give context for folks that haven't been to all three parts of this. Um, over the past year, we um, have done, actually, I do, I have these slides open. Um, apologies for kind of skipping around here. Um, but over the past year, we have um, been collecting feedback from users on what parts of the PDIS are really useful for folks and um, what parts have been challenging um, and uh, present barriers. We shared that feedback with a design team that helped us put together a new user interface design. And then over the past six or seven months, we have been, um, our, our development team has been putting in place that design on the site. So there are three main areas that are being updated. The first is a menu. So there's gonna be a cleaner menu that's now across the top of the site. And our content is organized um, in a more um, kind of understandable way where you just, you can see it and it all just makes sense. Um, the second area is the home dashboard. So right when you log in, we've put some of that more relevant and useful information right up front um, and made it uh, a, a better place for folks to interact and engage with the information that they need right away. And then the third area that we focus on is the learner home. And so that's what I'll be sharing with you all today. So this is where you can find all of the course content on the PDIS. So you'll see the new menu is across the top here. If you go to the learning menu and you click learner home, you'll get to the page that I'm on now. You'll see that it has a similar setup to the home dashboard with this graphic across the top. We still have these same mountains, but they're also kind of like little pencil tops as a, a call out to the learning that you'll be doing on this side. Um, we still have this um, this welcome here. It will, it will say your name, but again, this is a demo account. So if I were actually logged in, it would say hi Elaine rather than hi PDIS director. Um, rather than the notifications that we have on the home dashboard, we have some tips for using this learning side and um, finding what you're looking for. So these are some of the most common questions that we get through the help desk um, that we've, we've just put here that we hope will help people just be able to navigate and find what they're looking for. Right below this, we've got this search bar. And so this is how you can search for all of the content that we have hosted on the PDIS. It does have predictive search. So if you just start typing in, if you're looking for standard precautions, you just type in a word, all of our content that has that keyword in it will pop up and you can see it right here. Um, again, the other way you can get to search is to go to learning and do the learning search and that will get you to the standard search with filters and things that you can navigate by. So if you just wanna see all of the Spanish content or all of the required training content or different filters, you can do that through the learning search right here. But now walking through this dashboard, so I'm gonna start on the left side um, with this widget. This is kind of a, a simplified like profile widget, just giving you some information about who you are. Um, so again, this is your name. Um, if you are a director or a training manager, which means you have the ability to assign trainings to and, and different courses to the staff at your program, you'll see that right here. And then you'll also see your primary employer right here. Um, so this is important for how you're able to assign trainings. Um, so we just kind of have this key right here to help folks um, kind of align themselves with what, what information is showing up for them. If anything doesn't look great, you can click this link here and it will take you back to your employment page where you can make any updates that you need to. 
Below this, we have a My Team widget. So again, I'm logged in as a director demo account, which means I have a team that I can manage for my program. If you, do, or if you don't have this permission set and you don't have a team that you manage, then you won't see this widget here. Um, but because I'm logged in as a director, um, I, I see my team right here. One, um, one question that we get a lot is folks who aren't seeing their whole employee list show up correctly. Um, there's a few different reasons why that could be happening, but one main reason is the way that people add their employment to the PDIS. It has to be added in the right way for them to show up for you to be able to assign trainings. So we've added this widget here for you to just quickly see if all of your team members are showing up correctly. Um, this way you can just scroll through and see if anyone's missing and then go in and get that corrected. Below here is your learning summary. So this is a snapshot of how many courses you're currently taking. If you have any, so you'll see this number right here are in progress. If you have any courses that have been assigned to you with a due date assigned, and that due date is coming up or past due, you'll see the little notifications right here to let you know that you have um, got some work coming up. Below that, we have a tools widget. So this is similar to what's on the home dashboard, but with quick links that are rela related to learning. So this training calendar is all of our live and in-person events. My badges is a, how you can quickly see any badges that you've been awarded. And then add external training is to upload any certificates of trainings that you are professional development that you've completed outside of the PDIS that you want credit for in your account. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to keep going, but if anyone has any questions, um, like what are considered badges, um, I am actually going to throw that one to Jen McDonald because she was able to make it. <laughs> Uh, so right now, great question, right now in the system, we only have two badges for our trainings of special recognition, which include EQIT and Pyramid. We have um, kind of put the badges um, plan on hold so we can come up with a, a comprehensive plan for badges in the system. So more to come on this, we, it's kind of a placeholder. Um, so good question, and the answer is um, we don't have a plan quite yet. But please, uh, please hold for updates. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. All right, so our next widget over here on the right side, um, again, is something that only directors or training managers will see. So anyone who has the ability to assign training to staff at your program, if you don't see this and you think you should have this permission, um, you can connect with the director of your program or with the help desk and they can help you get that set up. Um, so this widget here we're really excited about um, and we, we hope that it will answer a lot of questions for folks. It is the completion status of the top six required trainings for all of the staff at your program. So you'll see here each of these are the, the top six required courses across all of the PDIS. Um, across different program settings. Um, and then you see a status symbol here. So if anyone in your program is not up to date, if any staff member at your program is not up to date on the certification, you'll see a red exclamation point here. If every staff member at your program is up to date, you'll see a green check mark. Um, we've built this in. So each of these have different requirements. For instance, this recognizing the impact of bias on EC professionals is something that professionals need to take once, and then once they've taken it, they um, they're, it's considered complete, whereas others of these need to be taken annually or every other year. So what you can see here is when you click this carrot, it expands and you see your entire staff list. Um, you will also see the last taken date of the course. Um, for this course, because it's something that only needs to be taken once, um, anyone, any staff member who has completed it has this last taken date and a status of complete. 
any staff member who hasn't taken it has this NA. You will also see up here due date. So if I were to go in and assign this training to my staff members, they would have an NA or a last taken date. And then next to it, they would have the due date that I've assigned to them. Um, once I assign them the due date, it will also show up for them in their learning summary as in progress. And then once that due date comes up, it will also show for that due date due in five days. Um, if we go down to one of these that has um, that annual requirement or biannual requirement, we'll see that some of these staff have already completed these trainings, but it's now expired. Um, so this will keep you, let you know that even if your staff have taken it. So for instance, these staff have completed it and they're within that year mark. So they're still in good standing, but these staff have, it's expired. So they need to retake it. Um, and so each of these will show that breakdown for every staff member and what their status is. Uh, I'm gonna take a pause here and look at the chat. Um, so Tony, these are the same six courses for every, um, for everyone, for all users. Um, so I, I apologize, I'm not, I, I don't have all of the different um, FCCH versus center-based requirements memorized, um, but I do believe that these requirements, at least most of them also apply for FCCH providers. Um, but we, this was a fairly complex piece to put together, so we're only able to build it out for these six trainings. And the the home playlist, which Elaine hasn't gotten to yet down below, will have the one specific for homes as well. Yes. Um, and again, there's this quick button here to assign your trainings to the staff. Once you do assign them, you'll see the due date show up for, for all of them here. All right. I'm going to keep scrolling. Um, so below this, we have recommended trainings for your staff. So again, these are just these top six required trainings. There are, of course, lots of other trainings in the PDIS that your staff can take and that staff are required to take. So there's lots of other required trainings here that different staff need to take depending on what role they have in your program. Um, so you can scroll through using the arrows here and see what some um, what some recommended courses are and then quickly click this button and go to the assign page. Um, if we have some time at the end, I can show you what that looks like. Um, but you can just scroll through here. Some of them are required, some are not, um, not required, just recommended based on different roles. Scrolling down, oh, and so um, now that we've gone through them all, these three widgets, the required employee trainings, my team, and recommended trainings for your staff. These three are the three that only directors and training managers would see. Um, so if you don't have that role or those permissions to assign trainings and manage a staff at a program, these three won't show up. So at the top, you'll see your information followed by this learning summary. And then on the right side, the top widget that you'll see is learning in progress. Um, so this learning in progress widget shows all of the courses that you're currently taking, um, including any that have been assigned to you that have a due date. Um, you can just hop back into any of them, clicking the continue button, scroll through if you have more than four, um, and continue taking anything. If you want to see all of the coursework, oh, sorry, um, I skipped ahead of myself. Pretend I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> Just below this is the required trainings and other playlists. So this is what Jen was mentioning. Um, we have all of the required trainings broken out by program type. So these are the required trainings for everyone who works in a child care and preschool. This is all of the required trainings for anyone who works in a family child care home. And then each of these are a link to that actual course. So you can click on it. It will take you to the course itself where you can jump into it and start taking it, or you can um, assign it to your staff if, if that is the permission set that you have. Um, what's also exciting about this one is that we can build on additional playlists that serve different purposes. 
Um, so for example, there's a new licensing requirement for one hour of child development um, PD a year. So what we're able to do is build a playlist of any coursework on the PDIS that meets that requirement. And then any user can go in here and just expand this playlist and see all of their options and choose which one they want to do. Um, similarly, we could do the same for anything that meets those social emotional hours or those trauma informed hours. Um, and so this is something if you if you all have requests for playlists that you think would be really beneficial to the field, um, send those ideas into us um, and we can build whatever playlists are useful. Um, and, and they're just available. Below here, we have your completed trainings widget. So these are all of the courseworks that you have completed. Um, you can view them right here, or you can click this button and go to all of your, to your learning transcript, and that will show you all of your completed trainings. That's where you can get those completion certificates if you need those. Then lastly, we have our suggested learnings widget. And so this is based off of if you complete the self-assessment in the PDIS um, or any, um, any past learnings that you do, it will recommend or suggest any learnings that it thinks you will be interested in based on the information that the system has about you. So it's a, a little AI component. Um, and you can scroll through and just see if there's anything that looks like it would be interesting to you. Um, and then the last thing I want to share is the footer. This is the same footer as um, on the home page and all of the other pages that we've walked through so far. Um, so it's not any different. We've got the help desk information here, some links here. Um, and then again, just want to draw your attention to this feedback survey. So if you open here, um, it is you can share um, any information that you want to see added, changed, updated to the PDIS. This contact information is optional. Um, we would really only use it if we have questions about the suggestion that you sent in that we want to clarify or follow up about. Um, and that will be in the footer. So that is, um, that is the new learner home of the PDIS. What questions do you all have? On the learning search, will L2 trainings be easy to find? Let's go to the learner search. Oh, no. So one thing that I didn't mention is that um, we're working in what, what we call the sandbox environment or our, our development environment. Um, and it's kind of how we're able to preview everything before it goes live. Um, and sometimes we get errors with that. Um, so I think I just tried to click that button and the page wasn't loaded fully. And I think that it didn't like me going to the learner search. So let me if I go back to Oh, it logged me out. Um, you all won't have these issues when it goes live. It's just because we're in this development environment, or at least we hope you don't have these issues, um, but that's why we're we're doing all of this ahead of time is to make sure that these issues are all resolved. All right. Um, so in the learning search, you'll see all of these filters here. Um, it's under. I can help you out. It's under you. subject. Okay. And it's listed as Colorado Shines Level Two. We have a lot of levels. There we go. Yeah. So any course that shows up here will count as level two. Okay, so to answer your question, Lisa, if you go to the learning search under subject Colorado Shines Level 2, everything here will count towards those L2 hours. Um, previous train, so Lacey, to answer your question, previous trainings and transcript docs. Um, yes, so this is, we've, we've gotten this question um, at a lot of our demos. Um, this is what we're doing with this um, kind of user interface refresh is, is very different than the new PDIS build in 2021. Um, so the, the entire system and the entire PDIS is um, the exact same. 
all of your information and all everything in your profile is staying the same. It's really just like the look of it that's changing. So everything in your system is, um, is still gonna be there. All of your trainings, all of your transcripts, all of your credentials and qualifications will be exactly as they are. Um, we are not, Alexander, we are not doing um, a, a staggered release. We're releasing it to everyone at the same time. Um, but that's why we are trying to do a lot of demos and get this information out to folks beforehand um, so that people can have information um, ahead of time and, and, and be somewhat prepared. Um, so actually that does remind me, let me get this link for you all. Um, we do have, a, we have demos going on every week. Um, and so these are open to the public. So anyone who's interested in going, we'll also, we're also working on getting resources out to folks. Um, so we'll be having um, some like promotional videos, knowledge articles, and, and just information so that when people do log on and see that everything is different, um, the resources will be there to guide people through it. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, I just wanted to say, actually, one of the things that we're talking about um, is having Elaine record um, a demo and so we can post it for folks to watch ahead of time of um, her more detailed step-by-step -step demo. Um, if you think that would be helpful for folks beforehand that's kind of we're wondering if you think that would be helpful and a useful tool seeing a couple of thumbs up okay um that's one of the things that we're looking at doing elaine does such a great job of demoing it and then if we have a video out there folks could watch it and pause and rewind and, and all of that so we'll send an update when that's available thanks for the feedback everyone um, yes, the help desk is the same, um, so you'll be able to contact them in the same way. They'll be hosting help sessions, um, the same, we'll, we'll take a pulse and see if there's um, a desire for additional help sessions or, or whatnot um, in the weeks post-release um, and, and see what the need is, um, but we're, we definitely want to be responsive to what folks are needing. Um, can an FCCH provider assign due dates for annual trainings for themselves, employees, and substitutes? Yes, they can. Um, screenshot guides, yes, we will have screenshot guides um, and, and all of that stuff available. That's, um, that's actually one of the main reasons why it looks ready, but we're not releasing it yet, is so we can get all of those how-to guides um, and kind of static resources ready for folks. Um, the demo tomorrow is going to include this as well as a walkthrough of um, the home dashboard, so it's going to be a, a little bit longer. Um, also, Charlie, I don't know what my time is, so please cut me off if I get there. Um, but the demo we have a, a couple more minutes. Okay, awesome. Um, so the demo tomorrow is going to include kind of this menu, this home dashboard, so all of the pieces that you see here, as well as um, what we walked through today. All right. Any any last questions? All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's it's really great to hear your feedback. Um, we are excited to show this to share this with you all. We hope that it is helpful. Um, we know that there's going to be some kinks and things to improve. So again, feedback survey on the bottom of the page. Send us your thoughts. Um, and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Elaine and PDIS. I know this has been a huge lift. You guys have been working on this for like six months at this point, if not more. And 
Um, the end result is looking gorgeous and super user friendly, and it really looks like you've taken feedback over the um, past two years that we've had PDIS on the Salesforce. Um, you've really taken that seriously and made the user improve uh, user experience much more friendly. And excited to roll this out. Um, yes. All right, so uh, we have one more topic today. Um, Lisa, are you on? I am. Hello. Hi there. We will get our PowerPoint up and running here. Just a second. Here we go. So hi, good afternoon all. I am Lisa Magliano and I'm here with Christine Beck. We're with Community Development Institute. And we wanna thank you for your time today and the opportunity to speak with you all about the Colorado Child Care Facility Survey. We have what we think is a pretty amazing opportunity to have a genuine influence on our child care community here in Colorado. And we are going to be asking for your help today in making that opportunity as impactful as possible. As a child care community, this is a valuable chance for us to inform decision makers about the state of facilities where we are currently caring for our children to advocate for improving those existing sites and increasing capacity, and also to provide concrete information about how to support our local communities in providing children quality spaces to thrive and learn. So with our time today, the last little bit of your all's meeting today, we will tell you about who we are and what brought us to this work We'll review this project that we're working on for the state and talk about our request of you all with the next steps. So Community Development, or CDI, was established as a nonprofit organization in 1970, and we provide management, training, technical assistance, and organization development services to both public and private agencies, serving low-income communities with a very strong primary focus on services for young children and their families. Over the years, we've worked and partnered with the Office of Head Start, the Office of Child Care, as well as the Environmental Protection Agency. Our team works directly with child care providers, including Head Start center-based programs, child care and school district partners, and family child care homes in diverse communities throughout the country. We have directly operated more than 260 unique Head Start programs in 46 states, including here in Colorado, uh, as well as DC, Puerto Rico, and seven tribal nations. With this contract for the state of Colorado, CDI is partnering with Chapin Hall, and they're an independent nonprofit research and policy center affiliated with the University of Chicago. Chapin Hall's work includes partnering to address challenges and building more effective services and systems to better serve children, youth, and families. So more specifically to our work here, CDI is particularly familiar with child care facilities. Uh, as you might imagine, in working with so many Head Start programs, um, we have extensive expertise in a wide variety of child care settings with things like daily facilities operations monitoring, but also environmental health, safety, uh, and facilities assessment. Since 2015, CDI has conducted on-site facility assessments for more than 700 child care centers, family child care homes, and preschool classrooms, all to move facilities with what can be really some uh, serious health and safety deficiencies into state-of-the-art environments, creating and providing those quality spaces for children to learn and thrive. And that brings us to our work for the state of Colorado. 
we have been tasked to collect and provide information to the state about the challenges and opportunities faced by child care providers, both currently and when looking at the potential for expansion or facility upgrades, including with regard to permitting, regulatory, and tax requirement barriers. Now, of course, as you all are very aware, our state is quite diverse. Um, and so to accomplish this, to be able to provide uh, the thoughtful assessment of the child care centers in Colorado that can then lead to higher quality for our children throughout the state, we'll need to gain knowledge from a wide range of service providers. And we're looking to accomplish this by utilizing a well-developed survey tool to gather the data that will be analyzed and shared with the state. So the data collected will provide decision makers, state and local legislators, the information needed to create change and make a difference for providers and their communities. It'll provide a snapshot of the current condition of early childhood facilities. So where are we at this particular moment in time? The potential for and barriers to expansion. Do current providers have space to expand? or are there others in the community interested? And what specifically do they need to move forward? And where are there opportunities for financial and collaborative investments with the greatest impact? What partnerships increase opportunities? Some background about the tool we're using. As I mentioned, we've been working with Chapin Hall and we've created a survey tool to collect this data. And it was developed based on the research and review of other states that have done this work before us. So looking at what was included by those states, what they found to be most helpful and successful. So the assessment that we've developed will be accessed through an online survey portal, accessible in either English or Spanish. The survey utilizes a branching logic model, so providers only respond to relevant questions based on their responses. The platform will open in March, which is right around the corner. <laughs> a provider can begin the survey and then save it and come back to it at a later date. We, you know, everybody's busy and is trying to do multiple things at once. It's also important to note that we're not specific, we're not asking for specific information about things like programming, curricula, staffing, or about participating families and children. It is strictly focused on the facilities piece. The results will be combined and compiled for use in reporting, so individual respondents will not be identifiable. And by completing the survey, providers' names will be included in a drawing. And we'll have to come back around to this because it was going to be a gift card, but we'll have to double check on the allowability of that at this point. But there will be incentives for completing the survey. Providers will be asked to share information about their space in five different areas. So the first section is the facility overview and, and ask for some basic background information about the provider's child care facility. So where it's located, type of building, uh, capacity and number and ages of children being served. In the building condition sections, we're looking to gain information about the physical condition of the child care facilities, as well as the ability and resources of child care providers to support that essential piece of the ongoing and preventative maintenance. So overall condition, age of facility, uh, repairs, maintenance improvements, how these are funded, um, as well as desired improvements to indoor and outdoor spaces. The financial information section, here we're hoping to really be able to describe realistically the true cost of operating childcare in the state. So looking at renting versus owning, the facility costs, the responsibility for uh, building maintenance costs, but also here what level of knowledge folks have about things like grant funding uh, and tax incentives that are available to offset some of these costs. The zoning, permitting, and regulations section, uh, here we want to be able to identify the common challenges faced 
by providers related to meeting these regulations. Um, so providers understanding of and experience with these requirements. And then here again, the knowledge of where to go to get information needed concerning these areas. And finally, the expansion challenges and opportunities section. These questions relate to providers community and the role of childcare in the community. So the interest, the potential space, the resources to expand the providers childcare services, as well as what the challenges are to the potential expansion. So that was a super quick overview of who we are and of the Colorado Child Care Facilities Survey. And here we are at our request. As I mentioned, to have the best information to share with decision makers, we need a good number of the child care providers in the state to take the time to complete this survey. And to do this, we are asking for all of, all of your help. Um, you all have the connections. Um, we have an initial announcement uh, coming soon. It's going out in the March CDEC newsletter. The announcement of the assessment and data collection window will occur through a mass email notification directly to providers. And then we have some promotional materials that we would like to share with you all. Um, that includes some more specific overview information for your knowledge about what the survey entails and include some announcements and reminders uh, to be sent out in communication to providers. So however, that typically happens uh, in each of your organizations. So newsletters, email blasts, whatever avenues that y'all have to help us get the message out. And if there is some other way that we haven't mentioned, uh, something creative that has worked previously, uh, if you get in touch with us, we can definitely work that out um, to make that happen. So that brings us to our contact information page then. The email here, surveys at cditeam.org. Any questions, um, any follow-up, any comments uh, sent to that email address, we will respond to that. Um, the phone number here is our office phone number. It will work. If you leave a message, we will most definitely call you back. We are also working to um, put together a phone number for specifically for this project. Um, and we will get that sent out to you all in that packet of information. So to wrap this up, just one more time, we would appreciate any and all opportunities that you all have with providers to encourage them to take the time to complete the survey and to reiterate the impact that we can all have as a group with the shared information. We believe we can create change by uniting and sharing our experiences as a community of child care providers. And we believe this is truly a meaningful opportunity to do just that. Questions. I came in with six minutes to spare. But that was a lot of information. Yes, Lisa. You know, my my one question is whether or not when you have your data, will you be able to tease out programs that are more specifically child care versus those that are more specifically operating as part day preschool programming so that we're not necessarily mixing up numbers for care versus preschool? We will be able to identify, yes, the differences in the types of services offered by the providers. Super, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Lisa? Again, more information coming as well. I know that was a lot to shoot at you all. Okay, well, thank you, well, thank you so much for your time. We 
certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for standing up this work. And um, I know this has been a concern of many people for a long time is, um, you know, figuring out where we are physically in terms of our physical buildings uh, for child cares. So, um, and especially with a lot of our rural um, communities, I know it's been a, um, something that's really been on our minds for a long time. So we're excited to stand this up and uh, you have our partnership in this. Cool. All righty, gang, we did it. Howard's here to wish everybody a wonderful weekend. Um, he's had a long day, so he's going to be taking a little nap. Um, but it's great to see everybody. Um, just so my councils know I'm going to be out tomorrow and Monday, but I will be back on Tuesday. Um, if you have any burning questions, I will also get our state TA day recording and everything like that. Uh, uh, out to you on Tuesday as well. Yes, Michelle, what's up? Uh, just a quick announcement. I did go in while we were um, all on this call and try to uh, fix the budget template. Um, if you guys could please go in, re-download it and see if I fix the problem, I would really appreciate it. And please send me an email if there's other issues that are coming up with that template that uh, with the formulas specifically that um, we need assistance with. All right. Thank you. See, we're, <laughs> we're always working <laughs> behind the scenes to make things right. Um, great to see you all. Lots of great information, lots of really great news and um, really exciting initiatives this month. Um, and looking forward to seeing everyone next month, I believe on March 28th. Have a great rest of your day and um, talk to you all later. Thank you. Thank you.